celebrating nine years of podcast excellence. The King of Podcasts Radio Network proudly presents the Wrestling Is Real Podcast because wrestling needs us. Well, I don't know about you, but I think MJF is staying around for a while. And we just got the beginning of a monster angle where MJF is now confronting one-on-one Tony Khan. And we can try to make the comparisons to Austin McMahon. We can try to make the comparisons to Flair and Bischoff. And you can do that. And we can only go that route. Listen, when you get some kind of feel of reality and you bring it to real life, as we've always heard, some of the best wrestling stories, folklore stories, always are based in reality. And everyone can relate to how the stories that the IWC and everybody was learning about when it comes to Tony Khan and MJF and all the expressions talk about it. I mean, if you're watching along and you're seeing the influx of former WWE talent coming into the doors and where Tony Khan has actually done a good job of making sure that his young pillars of talent are as well being focused and highlighted. I mean, just for the fact that they may not, might not all be holding belts, but there are certain things that they have in this company where Tony Khan makes sure to specialize and to give prestige to whatever it might be, whether it be the Owen Hart Invitational Tournament belts, which we saw both Britt Baker and Adam Cole come out with tonight. When it comes to the TBS or TNT titles, when it's the Dynamite Diamond Ring, all those things, they matter in the full circle of what AEW is about. The records, the rankings of these stars, all these things have value because Tony Khan with an AEW has created value for all these things. And when you get a promo, uh, you know, there's something about in the storyline for MJF, I talked about on Sunday during the post show for Double or Nothing. You can catch it at WrestlingIsRoll.com or wherever you find the show. I talked about the fact that there need to be some evolving of the character. It just can't be the same shenanigans he's doing where he has to try to get over on somebody. In a way, and listen, I've been watching Dallas a lot, the old school Dallas, and J.R. Ewing is a great example. When that guy is philandering, he's scheming, he's conniving, and he tries to screw people over. There are just times when that guy gets burned, and then he just comes back, and you know what? He's going to come right on back, and he'll come more reserved, more defined, and more definitive in what he wants to do with himself. And he'll just come out back. He'll come back as a better villain, as a much stronger and a much more determined villain with a new anger, a new mean streak to make sure he takes it and gives what he wants to give as the punishment to the people he feels sees fit. So his contention is no longer with the stars in AEW as much as it is the fans, which he called out tonight, and Tony Khan himself. Now, I don't know how Tony Khan's going to be involved in the storyline and how they're going to use him because we know that (laughs) <laughs> we know that MGF versus Tony Khan, MGF can wipe Tony Khan for promo ability out the water anytime you want. A hundred out of a hundred times. There's no question about it. Um, Maxwell Jacob Freeman is gifted on the mic. And I can say, as a fan of AEW and a fan of MGF, because I think arguably one of the best wrestlers we have today, he is. like I'm going to just say like this. MGF is my favorite wrestler right now. I don't ever do that. But he is by far the best wrestler we got. This guy's promo ability, he has. You know, and I'll tell you, somebody was up. I, I got to say this. Kevin Castle, formerly of the Don Tony Kevin Castle show, he put up a tweet that really said it a lot. And I just said to myself, man, he really just put something out that made me think a lot. And I was just like, wow, I can't believe he said this. And so I got to take what he said here and just say that 
what he said in this night was incredible. I got to bring this across. Now, a lot of people really did give a lot of praise to what it was said. And so, yes, Kevin Castle said this about MGF. I don't tell you. This was incredible that I actually saw it. Because he has not been very high on AEW. He's very much, you know, a fan of WWE, and that's totally justified. As many fans are. And, of course, there's a bit of a people that have a little bit of onus with AEW. I'm not one of those guys because I was one of those guys that flipped between Raw and Nitro. And I actually watched more Nitro than Raw. But here's something what I saw that I really thought was amazing. He says, I think MJF is the only modern wrestler who has managed to take elements of three classic bad guys. And the three bad guys he picks, these are great. Okay. He says he's a mixture of Brian Pillman, Roddy Piper, and Gino Hernandez. That is, that is quality right there. You know, the crazy, the, the, the psycho, just that schizophrenic kind of feel of Brian Pillman, Roddy Piper with just that sarcasm and just that fool, I mean, just doesn't give a shit. And Gino Hernandez, who was just full vanity and smugness and just cocky. It's, it's, it's a very high regard for the man. And then he closes and says, and yet not be a blatant copy of them. MGF is one of his kind of his generation, no doubt. That says a lot to me. And, you know, I don't see a lot of people. And, and honestly, I saw other people that are very much been WWE centric and praising MGF because he is such a one of a kind wrestler that we have today. And this promo and everything that came, came about as a result with all the things that were going on leading up to Double or Nothing, we heard rumblings. Which could have very, and listen, maybe this work was just going on for a long time. I'm going to say, I believe this was a work the entire time. And I was in denial that maybe something would happen, but I wasn't going to go out and be public about it. But I felt like this was a work the entire time. And I was scared to say something. I didn't want to not be one of those guys that would just get attacked for saying that. So I didn't. But when I saw what happened here with MJF, that promo tonight, I never said anything bad about his wrestling ability. You can listen back to every pre previous show I ever said. I have not had a bad thing to say about MJF, period. And, you know, he might have talked about other people might not have watched him wrestle. I have. I watched him in MLW. He was fucking great. All right. I got to see him there. And I was saying back then, I'm sure if I go back and listen to a, a previous show, back when MLW first came back on, and I saw him out there with Arya Blake initially. I mean, the first time I saw him cut a promo with Arya Blake out there outside the debutante, right? And MJF, it's for this crowd of 500 people, whatever it was. It wasn't a 2300 arena. It was some other arena. It was Orlando. It was that club. It's that nightclub they were doing. Uh, what were the? What, what was that place they were going to? I forget. I gotta look that up real quick. What was the name of that damn nightclub they used to go to? Guilt Nightclub. That's what it was. They would do shows there at the early part of MLW's return. What was that 2018? Something like that? And that guy would come out. And I was like, this this mother effer. Okay. What's going on here? Cause he honestly was like, that's not normal. That guy's a diamond in the rough. There's something about him. And you know what it is, too? I mean, he doesn't wrestle with all flip-flop. Like, you know, he's not a spot monkey. He doesn't do any of that. He can. This guy can wrestle whatever kind of style you want. This guy is sound. He is safe in the ring. He is amazing with his facials. He knows how to get heat. He is, he is steamed in classic heel wrestling. This guy is the best heel in the business, bar none. Listen, MJF is a better heel than Roman Reigns. Literally, MJF lives the heel lifestyle. I've watched documentaries that he's done. 
The Chris Van Vliet promo, staying a character. If you have not watched that video on Chris Van Vliet's video YouTube channel, if you have not watched that interview, if you did not want, if you did not listen to him doing the wrestling show on Bar on Barstool Sports, this guy consistently a character and fantastic. He knows his character. He is very good at it. <laughs> Just it's amazing. But also what intrigued everybody as well, which is what exactly what Tony Khan and AEW did with MJF. And this is MJF, Tony Khan put this together. And let me tell you, masterful job, masterpiece. This is as good or probably better than what we saw in the Attitude Era. Because right here, but how are they going to do it? Like, I mean, it's we've seen what, he, what they've done with feuds with him and Punk and Jericho and Cody. I mean, the evolution of this character to put him through so many major feuds with so many major ex WWE stars. Let's make that point too. Like he did have a couple of the pillars when it came to Darby Allen, right? But I'll tell you what. When you look here and you see what he's done with him, am I am I correct? MGF has never worked dark or dark elevation. Never. I don't think not a one. That's one sign of how important that Tony Khan knew that MGF was going to be to the detriment of his company. To the benefit, excuse me, not detriment, benefit. And then you look at the progression of what they had at MGF once he dropped out of MLW because they couldn't afford him. And yes, exponentially, MGF is now worth a lot more. And that pipe bomb he pulled out tonight at the level of CM Punk in Las Vegas, at the level, it was, I mean, it was legit. It, it felt real, real anger, real emotion, real passion through all of that. It was amazing to see. And we got to go through that promo and what he said there's so much to be said. Let's get into that promo. I got to talk about this because honestly, Dynamite tonight from the Kia Forum, Los Angeles, the the infamous forum in Inglewood, California, a great old school venue for wrestling. And for him to do this, full crowd, 13,000 plus. Warner Brothers Discovery was on hand tonight. Their executives were there. They introduced a new set for the event too, right? Like if I'm right, let me just look at that story again. Because the set looked amazing. They stepped it up. I already liked the set they had before. But this this new set was also something pretty special, I must say. So now you have an LED stage. They've used on some bigger shows like Dynamite Grand Slam. The tunnels and behind the tunnels you can see a wide LED screen. And they mentioned that Warner Discovery Executives will be throwing a party for Tony Khan on AEW after the show. 13,735 ton tickets were distributed for tonight's show. One of the highest attended Dynamite shows in the company's history. And that's through WrestleTix. And they put out a pretty good show tonight. But yeah, that stage looked amazing. Looked really impressive. What they all put together, it looked good. And the show they gave tonight was really excellent. People are praising that show tonight. So going into it, CM Punk and FTR... You set that whole setup. A great match for the with Max Caster and Gun Club. I mean, Gun Club has had a great record. Max Caster now working without Anthony Bowens, the acclaimed. You get that. And then you move along. And CM Punk talked about Forbidden Door. And the reveal of Hiroshi Tanahashi as CM Punk's opponent for the AW World title. And, you know, I didn't know I would see that match. That's a dream match, and I, I love it. What I mean, come on. Have we seen Tanahashi in any... I, I don't even remember. Did we see Tanahashi in Ring of Honor? I'm pretty sure we did. We already saw Okada there. But I'll tell you, rare time to see Tanahashi come across from the into the States for this show. That's a hell of a match to start off with. Really great. So that's a hell of a match you're going to start off with. And then MJF, I'm going to take this from Wrestling.com. 
arresting INC. And here's what they say in the re- in the results for MJF. And I just want to go through what he says, man. Because this needs to be broken down. I'll go through as quick as I can. And just relish in how good this promo is. And like I said, when MJF has done some promos, when he talks about Cincinnati, the promo to cut against the, feud, the short feud he had against Brian Pillman, right? When he had a few feuds, him with Darby on, him with Brian Pillman, those were short. They were one-offs, but they were important. Now, that promo, amazing. The initial start promo of CM Punk and MJF, amazing. And there's many times he's done this. This best promo to date, one of the best promos I've heard all year, and one of the best promos I've heard, jeez, man. Kind of hard. Kind of hard to kind of tell you how far back this goes. But this is one of my all-time favorite promos right here. And, I mean, it could be up there at the, le- <laughs> at the level of hard times. Okay? Or Ric Flair talking about the alligators. Putting these, uh, keeping those alligator shoes down, right? This was amazing. So, he's in a lot of pain. So, he's stressing the fact he got stretchered out on Sunday. But all the people want to hear is him talk. He says it would be a real shame if something bad happened tonight as there are a lot of important people in the audience. Referencing Warner Brothers Discovery. And he says Tony Khan's been wanting to sit down with him for a while, but it's a little too little, little too late. Man. Everyone's a hand on the ticket of the start, but he had to write his own. He created a moment right away. This is all true. Full shoot. Because he didn't come into the company right away. He was brought in through Cody, remember? And the Nightmare family. Like, MGF was not there at the onset. And that's what I always remember, too. MGF was still working MLW, and then he started working both. Finished with MLW, whatever dates he had, and then went full-time AEW. Which made full sense to me at the time, because I was like, you know what? AEW, you want to pick some young stars that are going to be up and coming, that are going to be very important down the line? I would have told you then. MGF was one. I was like, that's a great move. There's something about that guy. And I'm sure I said it. I know it. I can go back to past episodes and find it if I had to, okay? Let's move along. He created moment after moment for this company, but he still gets no respect. He claims nobody is on his level, and there's nothing he cannot do. He's expected to hit grand slams. Not home runs, but grand slams. And he does that shit on a weekly basis. He has to be perfect as he's held under a Microsoft as only the only capable g- guy capable of carrying the company. <laughs> now, we know there's a lot of great stars they have in that company, but you know what? For all the fans out there, for all my fellow wrestling podcast brethren that want to go ahead and praise the fact that we see, look, we see Miro and Johnny Elite and Kyle O'Reilly and Bobby Fish and Brian Danielson and John Moxley and Chris Jericho. And all the former WWE stars or NXT stars. We see Athena come in. We see William Regal, right? And you say to yourself, I don't always focus so much on those favorites. As you know me, King of Podcasts, I like underdogs. And I'm always fans of underdogs. So I'm always watching NWA or MLW. Or Impact Wrestling. I mean, hell, that Impact Wrestling is the biggest underdog company there is. And I'm a fan of them. And I support, and I always talk about those guys as much as I can, especially when they do their pay-per-views. I'm always praising. And I'm always saying it like it is. Now, MJF is an underdog. He's the dark horse. This guy is going to find his way to the top among all those people. And by the way, when you think about every time he's had a confrontation with any star, you're telling me he did not go toe-to-toe with CM Punk? You're telling me he did not hold his own against Chris Jericho or more times than not actually cut better promos than, than Chris did? You're telling me that MJF did not live up to the level of him with Cody? Of course he did. Of course he did. MJF has always stepped up as has been at level or better than his opponent on the on the mic. 
And he doesn't have to be the face that has to overperform. He's the heel. He's playing his role absolutely to the bone. The heel wrestler never is going to put out the most effort. It's all psychology in the ring. And MJF is full psychology. And you can see he could take charge in the ring. And he runs the matches. And he has great pacing and timing. And just has all the intangibles. And they always talk about that joke about WWE. They have all the, all the skills. No, no, no. MJF has all of it. He's the full tool belt. He's the Swiss army knife. This guy is capable of any wrestling match and any promo needed. He <laughs> lives, eats, and breathes wrestling like no other. It's incredible. The only thing I guess I would have probably wondered is like, they didn't put a neck brace on him to sell the power bombs, but, you know, I guess you didn't have to do that. I mean, you, I would have thought they could have done that, but they didn't want to show him weak. It's just get him out there. And, I mean, he did say he was in pain. So, like, I'm not going to judge. I'm not going to nitpick here. It's not, not necessary. He says it's interesting that he hears clapping because he's got people up. And they are, they, they are showing respect to the man. They're booing him at the start. Shut the fuck up. And it doesn't matter because then he starts going and then they just, this crowd just can't help it, man. They, they, he's just, they respect because he is speaking truth, which a good, hot crowd, a smart crowd is going to do. And then he says, where were they this weekend when they called him unprofessional? He tells the guys in the back that can have his spot because he doesn't want to be here anymore. He tells the fans they're uneduca uneducated marks who sit and tweet their opinions. He's not wrong. And I'm one of them. I'll admit, I'm not uneducated. Maybe I can be a little bit uninformed, or maybe I'm just not completely, you know, involved, if you will, or caught up in the palace intrigue or the gossip that some other wrestling Twitter arteries are out there doing. And then MGF tells the fans they don't know shit and their opinions suck and change at the drop of a dime. He's absolutely right about that, too. He is just telling truth. Truth bombs over and over and over again. And he says people claim they always knew he was a good wrestler. Uh, you know, I knew he was a good promo cutter. I could never say anything about him in the ring. Because the truth was, I mean, he never, he wasn't doing anything to overshine anybody. He's playing the heel. I mean, some of the best heels did not do that much. I mean, some of the best heels did not have to do much of anything except just really show off. Well, don't get me wrong. There are stars that were great wrestlers that could just move around. Like, I mean, you think of Ted DiBiase or, you know, Jake Roberts or like a Gino Hernandez. Yeah, well-rounded wrestlers. And you can think of other stars that really could just, you know. But the, what was overshadowing was the fact of what they were doing in the ring to get the heat on them and to continue to get the heat on them. Because MGF is, is, is a heat magnet. He does not want cheers. He kept stopping them. Except for Long Island, which is the complete bizarre world which we love. Because <laughs> he's, he's good about that. And even he had to go ahead and kind of put down his, his fans in Long Island like he did, which was wonderful. And then he goes along and says... Is it because he doesn't pretend to watch New Japan or chase star ratings? So he's calling out those that say they watch New Japan and that are big fans of Japan. Listen, I'm not watching King of the Super, Super Juniors or the tournaments. I'm not watching every match from Budokan Hall or Tokyo Dome. Okay, I don't do it. You know, I might catch a little bit of New Japan Pro Wrestling, the program after Impact Wrestling. I might have it on afterwards, right? Or I'll catch Wrestle Kingdom. But other than that, I don't watch all the New Japan stuff. I wish I had time. I mean, it is good. But I hear enough from Dave Meltzer, who also got called out here because he's chasing star ratings. That is, that's calling out Dave Meltzer and his rating system at Wrestling Observer. Great. 
I can't wait to hear what Dave Meltzer says about that part of his line. I, they're going to put a clip out tomorrow on YouTube for the freebies, which is what I listen to. And I'll hear that. And, I'll, and I'll, I can't wait to hear what, what Dave and Brian say about it tomorrow. Dave Meltzer and Brian Alvarez. He's the best because he makes you feel like, unlike the rest, he doesn't need bullshit to get fans there. He says it isn't just the fans who take it for granted. It's the big man in the back as well. He's calling out Tony. He asks who the second biggest minute-for-minute minute Raw draw in the company is. It's him. They should ask Stat Boy Tony. <laughs> I'll tell you what. And it's very nice for Tony Khan to allow him to, allow him to be depraved like that and to be this ingratiated like that, that kind of level of criticism and ridicule to his real-life boss. And Tony Khan, trooper for letting it go and for also taking on the storyline. But don't ask them to pay the man who's been busting his ass for him. He should hoard all that money to give it to all the ex. And this is the line that everybody got. He should he should hoard all that money to give to all the ex WWE guys who can't lace his boots. Imagine, imagine if MJF were cutting this promo with what we know of him now, and he was in WCW. Imagine the level of vitriol you would have. From Hulk Hogan, Lex Luger, Outsiders, Hall and Nash. Could you imagine? Could you imagine the level of, you know, of, of, of just anger? And the kind of backstabbing that would be wanting to do to MJF for cutting a promo like that. And knowing that Eric Bischoff was in the pockets of all these guys. These ex, uh, Randy Savage, right? All these ex WWE guys in the same way. And listen, he's calling out that, that Tony Khan, in very many ways, especially in this last year and a half, especially since Dynamite Grand Slam or since Chicago and the United Center, he is playing the Eric Bischoff playbook of taking all these guys that WWE released. Like, it wasn't as if. And it's a different story because Eric Bischoff was luring stars out of their contracts when the like if they were in handshake deals or things like that, or when the contracts came up, you know, discussions were being had to get certain stars to ju make the jump. Like, there's free agents out there that WWE let go, and they were out already. And sure, they might have had discussions while they were still under contract and the con non-compete clause was in play. But Tony Khan's only going after the free agents that are out there. But we also know that Tony Khan's going to have the money to get these certain guys in there. Because how many of those guys that have come in would have gone over to Impact or MLW? Like, there's only a handful that it did. And you can see them go somewhere else. They're going to say, like, well, Matt Cardona or W. Morrissey, you know, or Brian Myers. Like, you can see some former WWE stars that could have been picked up by AEW if you wanted to, but they didn't. Like, there's certain stars that you had. Plus, you also had the fact that Ring of Honor was in such shambles before all these free agents came in. So, the possibility to go there, like a Samoa Joe or Brian Danielson or Adam Cole or Bobby Fish or Kyle O'Reilly or all these different guys. They wouldn't have had a chance to go there because Ring of Honor wasn't anything where it is now. Now it's a different story because we have Ring of Honor now and Tony Khan owns it. So moving along here, MGF asks Tony if he'd treat him better if he was an ex WWE guy because he says the only position Tony should have is behind the guardrail. He was hitting haymakers with those promo with that promo tonight. Landing some body blows, and 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 then he says that he doesn't have to wait until twenty twenty four. He tells Tony to fire him, calls him a fucking mark, and then his microphone gets cut and the entire stream gets cut off. And by the way, they did cut off him saying that, but for effect in the arena, yeah, yeah, and an uncensored version went out. So if you wanted to hear it, this was masterful. How much does Tony Khan get involved in this? I think he'd have to have some wrestlers that have to be intervening for him. Or some of these ex-WWE guys need to come in and step in front 
of Tony Khan. I don't know what you do. I mean, does Tony Khan sound like the the heel here? Does MGF does he kind of sound like he's a face here? He's a tweener. We have to let this play out. But just the thought of this right here, and that MGF's next major storyline, major angle, is going after Tony Khan. Man, it it's it's a proper evolution of the character. It's a proper evolution of where things are. They've played this out. They put out the seeds to make this storyline become possible. And they just wove it together to make it sound something something great. And they did a, ex, an excellent job with this so far. So this is a storyline that's going to be very enjoyable down the line. And you want to talk about something that's going to bring people back the next week and the next week after that. I'm surprised. I thought we were going to see MGF anymore. But then they showed he's going to speak. We're going to hear from MGF. When I read that, I was like, wow, what the hell is this? But I'm guessing that, and hopefully we hear this down the line, we kept hearing the thing that, that most likely while MGF's contract ends in 2024, no announcements have been made, but I am imagine that he has signed a contract extension and that he has gotten a bump in pay. Deservedly so. I mean, he's earning the paycheck he gets now. And isn't that amazing? They say that he's one of the people that absolutely people will go to watch and see. And this storyline right here. And by the way, all these storylines and all these matches, there's no belts on the line. The one prestigious, valuable thing he has is that dynamite diamond. That's what he won. Otherwise, he has been this pure, magnanimous, incredible heel they don't make heels like mjf this is a once in a generation wrestler and kevin castle's right you don't get this all the time but when you do appreciate the man maxwell jacob friedman yes i just spent a half hour praising this man but what also has to be discussed is the level of what i talked about as the focus of tonight's show Disgruntlement, disagreement, and dissension. There's two ways to handle it. Because you have what's going on now with MJF and what's being done. Now in storyline. And then what's being done right now with other wrestlers and other stars that have come from WWE that have not been shown so much that there has been their levels of disgruntlement, disagreement, and dissension that we have now which has caused some issues with morale in the locker room I'm not one to go ahead and just follow along and say okay I don't need to be a cheerleader for Sasha Banks and Naomi I already took my time a couple of weeks ago to focus on the fact that listen they can do whatever they want it's totally wrong that the suspenses are happening, but you know we don't know the whole story as to why everything happened. But the truth is, if they don't ever come back, I can understand why, because they don't have to. I mean, I think Sasha Banks, I've said it, has a career that goes outside of this altogether. Oh, and by the way, Blood and Guts Two is announced for June 29th in Detroit, so you got a major show coming up for Dynamite, and that's in four weeks. That's going to be great. So we'll have that to go and look for coming up pretty soon. That's good stuff. Now, let's get into this here. So, yeah, after Anarchy in the Arena, we'll go bugging Blood Guts 2. So there's an update on Sasha Banks and Naomi's WWE suspension. And so we have not heard from them since the May 16th episode of Monday Night Raw. Since they rocked out. We never saw them on TV that night. And that... Uh, WWE suspended Banks and Naomi indefinitely after they walked out and stripped, and the company stripped them of their women's tag team titles. Little to no communication between the team, between Naomi and Sasha, and WWE, according to Fightful Select. And that WWE has, can has canceled travel plans the organization had for both of them. 
Now, there's no word as if, if their contracts have been frozen, as we know that happened with Bray Mysterio Jr. before he re-signed. But Feifel noted a higher up in, in WWE said that they don't think their contracts could be frozen if the talents were not being paid because they're saying they were suspended without pay. So the freezing part's not happening unless it was the other way around. Now, following the tag team titles being vacated, we know Michael Cole specifically said there will be a tournament to crown new champions, but the plan appears to be dead. And several within the company reported that the titles, they didn't want them to be vacated, and that became the option that the company decided to take. If for all I know, look, WWE has only used those titles to prop up certain stars that are not in the main event title picture. And it's funny that it's Sasha Banks that has held those belts multiple times. Her and Bailey, and now her and Naomi. But that goes for other stars in the same way, where Shayna Baszler and Nia Jax held it for a long time. It's that thing where it doesn't really matter who has the belts. They're props. They're, something, they're, they're a token of appreciation for those stars. Because they can be taking on whoever they want, and it doesn't make much of a difference. There's no prestige behind those titles. Much like there's no prestige behind the IC title or the U.S. title. They're basically trinkets. They're props to be held of some kind of importance for Ricochet, who's now Intercontinental Champion, or Theory, who is U.S. Champion. But those championships are not focused at all. Not really much anyways. I mean, there's some focus on them now more than there was, but it doesn't really matter because we've been we've been programmed, we've been accustomed to not care about the mid card belts, and at this moment, the only belts that matter are the unified tag team titles with the Usos, the unified World Heavyweight Champion with Roman Reigns, and you can say. The women's championships with the Raw champion, Bianca Belair, and the SmackDown women's champion, Ronda Rousey. And those are the only ma- championships that matter. All these other championships don't. The 24-7 title? No. They're props. All the mid-card titles, all their titles that are not world uh, singles or tag team titles, they're not mattered. And only the men's tag team titles, not the women's. As far as I'm concerned, the women's tag team titles could be dissipated. You could fade those out if you wanted to and never bring them back because it doesn't matter and they don't have to do a tournament you know what they could do they could do a gauntlet match and then have whatever stars you want to bring in on one night crown new tag team champions they don't need a tournament a four team term they don't need that they could do it in a gauntlet and be done okay they could have you know the gauntlet match would be have the, the, the tag teams drawn at random and brought in, and that's it. They could do that. Doesn't really matter. Anyway, that's the deal with that. But look, the tag team titles don't matter. What does matter is that Sasha Banks and Naomi, they have left. And now there's no more communication between them, it sounds like. Well, suspended without pay could continue for a while for both of them and they could do that until the end of the contracts they don't have to be brought back I mean they're not but it is a punishment and they are being set as examples for the rest of the company for everybody else that wants to realize you don't you don't screw with Vince and you don't screw with where things are that you know this publicly traded company looks bad on them when they have, this kind of goes on. And that's what they're going to feel. Now, worry about the contracts themselves. There was a story that Wrestling Inc. put out about that. And by the way, I do like Liam Crowley. I see him on the TikTok all the time, giving stories that come out on a regular basis, and I appreciate him doing all that all the time. Now, going back to what we learned over the weekend that Wrestling Inc. reported, is that Dave Meltzer and Wrestling Observer Newsletter the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, he regarded that Banks and Naomi are being suspended without pay. Fightful Select noted they hadn't confirmed whether this was true at the time, but had been told what was described by WWE Hired Up, that they, they were suspended with pay, without pay. They could not have fro- their contracts frozen. 
Now, they could be free agents later this summer. Meltzer reported that Naomi's contract was set to expire within the next couple of months. Former WWE writer Kazim Famuide, Famuide, I guess, said that Banks' deal was also up soon, and no confirmation was given that Banks and Naomi's deals haven't been frozen. And as we know, Banks has been spotted in public. Naomi mentioned removed mentions of WWE on her Twitter, and. WWE, WWE had a, another case of another advertised match not going on as planned on Raw because we never got Lacey Evans' return match despite it was being promoted for a week. Which is really surprising that the company's actually been promoting matches for the next week or upcoming with some time to build up. Which has not been the case as of late. But that's where they're going with all that. So I'm very much surprised with how things went. And then there's the, also the other issues where we talk about all the dissension that's going on as well with WWE when it comes to Bray Wyatt. And they're talking about how he might make a return and where would he return to? Because he's another person that was dealt with disgruntlement, disagreement, and dissension. It's just an ongoing story. It's just that we're having certain stars that have not been released yet. That's the other part. They could have very well released Sasha Banks and Naomi. And in many cases, they would do it or would just release the contracts. But for whatever reason, they're taking, they're putting their foot down here. Because there were plans for Naomi and Sasha Banks to do what they were going to do. But for whatever reason, they're not releasing like they would normally do. It's as if there's something about that we know that first of all they're already kind of running a little bit light on talent on that roster because there's not that many people as there once were and they're not signing people back like they might have done a couple of times with other stars at this point they have a pretty lean roster they're working with who they're working right now on tours on the road with Raw and Smackdown shows and with the TV schedule that they have they're light on the they don't have a very heavy roster now like they once did. And they don't have a lot of high profile talent on that roster either because their schedule I mean well their matches that they have right now, what they're gonna be doing this weekend, they got NXT in your house on Saturday and Hell in a Cell on Sunday, and let me tell you, you're not getting the Roman Reigns and the Usos on either of those shows. Now you're gonna see what the rest of that company has. Of what they've been working on so far. Because here's what we're going to talk about now. we got to talk about Hell in a Cell. Because what you're getting right now. Is a focus of all the storylines. That we're working on right now. Specifically. On Raw and Smackdown. Since post WrestleMania. And more specifically after. Everything going on with. Uh, a post uh, WrestleMania backlash. So right now you look and you say to yourself, okay, at this moment, we're looking at the matches they have. So they have two championship matches, Raw Women's title and the U.S. title. Ronda Rousey is not scheduled to defend the SmackDown Women's title at Hell in a Cell. She's a part-timer. Judgment Day has yet to have a match booked for this show. Fight Night has not been booked for any match on the show. I'm trying to think of who else there is that has not been booked yet either. I mean, there's a number of stars they still have that have not been booked on anything as of, far, as, as of yet. That could be. Mostly Raw matches are on the card right now. So we don't know if Friday Night SmackDown is going to have a couple of matches that will be added on last minute. To build up for the pay-per-view. We don't know that yet. But if we want to go back and look at SmackDown from this past weekend. You know we got Shinsuke Nakamura and Riddle. That were going after the Usos. But there's no match schedule with them on the card. That has not been announced yet.
You know, we had the deal where Rousey and Rodriguez, they originally were going to have a rematch for the SmackDown Women's title, but then it just became a no contest because of Natalya and Shayna Baszler interfering. And then we could very well have Rousey, Rousey and Rodriguez take on Natalya and Baszler. That match could be scheduled for the pay-per-view for all we know. They've been building up Jinder Mahal and Shanky against Los Lotharios. They could do something with that. Gunther and Ludwig Kaiser dealing with Ricochet and Drew Gulak. I mean, Rick, right now Ricochet and Gunther, we haven't gotten that match scheduled yet. But they haven't scheduled for Hell in a Cell. That's not been put on the card yet. And Drew McIntyre, New Day, Brawling Brutes, nothing scheduled with them at all right now. Nothing with Alpha Academy, nothing with Street Profits, none of it. There's a lot of stars right now that are not on this show because they have a focus on other matches going on for this card this weekend. Now, we'll br we're going to bring that up now because then I'll talk about NXT in your house in just a minute. We'll talk about that at the closeout. But anyways, Hell in a Cell. They've taken quite a bit of time on Cody Rhodes and Seth Freakin' Rollins. Third, the rubber match for them in the Hell in a Cell. Makes sense. It's the right time to bring it up here. So that works out good. And that's the match that's going to probably be the main event, unless they do something else. Because there's no other match that's going to be up to that point. That's going to be it. And it looks like that's going to be the only Hell in a Cell match for this show. No women's Hell in a Cell match. Triple threat for the Raw Women's title. Now, if they're going to keep this card like it is and add maybe like two more matches, well, the card, that's going to be a big show. It's going to be a lot of time for these wrestlers, too. Like, I can see Cody and Seth going 30 minutes. Maybe a little bit longer for Hell in a Cell. Roman's title, that could go 15, 20 minutes. And you got the U.S. title, Theory versus Mustafa Ali. I don't know. Or Mustafa Ali. Uh, I thought they were saying it the other way around, but I forget. You got that going for you. And that could be like 10 minutes. Then the handicap match with MVP and Omos versus Bobby Lashley. That could be 10 minutes. But really, you're thinking about it, that's like two that's not even a two hour pay-per-view right there. They gotta add some more matches. And Ezekiel versus Kevin Owens, which is been not so much about confrontation as it is when you have where well, we haven't seen much of them where Ezekiel's been always working in matches. But the one on one kind of thing, how's this gonna go? Where Ezekiel's just been put in this role of like, okay, trying to prove that he is not Elias, and that's the one dimension we have of the character so far. There's not much else to work off of. And Kevin Owens being completely hysterical, trying to prove that Ezekiel's actually Elias. Which has been an interesting storyline to me. It's like, you know, I'm entertained by it. And that's it. Not much else to go with. Could they add more matches coming up? I don't know. I mean, they could. But at the moment, they're not. But when they're looking right now, yeah, there's not much else they're talking about that, that goes down to what could really finish off what was going on with what this paper you could have to really finish things up that could be also added to the card because it does the, the card warrants another match or two to be added could there be anything else we don't know but we know that we already got the triple threat for the Romans title that was focused on the Mysterios are not on this show Alexa, Bi Alexa Bliss, Dewdrop, Nikki Ash, and Nikki A.S.H., they're not being featured on the show. The Miz is not being featured on the show. I don't think they're going to be showing the 24-7 title anywhere on the show, but that's part of things as well. Liv Morgan and Rhea Ripley, the whole Judgment Day versus the, you know, this reinforce reenactment of the Bullet Club, the pseudo Bullet Club reunion, with Liv Morgan part of the action, that's it. So for the most part, they have most of the storylines in play, but the Hell in a Co Hell in a Cell card has. They need a couple of matches to fill the rest of the card, and I don't know if they're going to just add those at the very end or what. So we'll figure out what they're going to do with that. I mean, for the most part, listen. 
they're keeping it very simple. They're keeping it very light. They're not worrying about a whole lot of stars they need to go and make sure to push up and then do anything with. You know, they're not going to focus too much. They have certain stars they're working on. They're trying to build up and they're trying to make something of. So Theory and Ollie are going to get their own featured match. That's actually pretty commendable for them. When you look at the, the, the stars that they have that are trying to build up and do something with. Theory and, La Theory and Ali, that's going to be an interesting match. How much time they get and what they're going to be able to do in the ring. Like, it should be a great match. Like, I hope those guys shine about everybody else. I mean, will they start with that match? I don't know. But, I mean, there's a lot more stars they could start off with that they're trying to build up. But like I said, Theory being part of this card... Defending the U.S. title. It's a big deal here. Let's see what they do with it. Now, NXT has it in your house coming up this weekend. And so far, like, there are certain stars they have here that I just don't care for. That I feel like they're just, you know, they're just not likable. I feel Wendy Chu is not likable at all. Lash Legend is not likable. And I'm not really big on Cam. Uh, excuse me, on uh, Carmelo Hayes. I don't, I don't like him much either. Not like it's a heel face kind of thing. I just don't like him. They just rub off the wrong way. Now, NXT North American Title, Cameron Grimes will defend against Carmelo Hayes. This is after Cameron Grimes won. What was that? That that uh, was it a ladder match? I guess he won it. There was a, it was like a, f a five way, wasn't it, or four way? I forget. So Cameron Grimes has had this title. I'm really surprised he's still here and he holds this belt. I don't see Cameron Grimes ever moving up. Like there, I don't see a call up coming for him and something's going to happen. By the way, nothing with uh, Max Dupree. There's been nothing about him. We just sent him backstage with Adam Pierce, but we haven't had nothing else. And by the way, no Sonya Deville they've spoken of as well. So you have certain things they could be doing here, but they're not. It's just, I mean, there's a couple of things that are just kind of limbo right now, but they have certain storylines they're working on and are definitely focusing on at the moment. And only a couple, only so many of those storylines are actually going to be worthy of being on the pay-per-view. Now, as for NXT, back to that. I don't, it's a, it's a toss up and I'm going to guess Carmelo Hayes wins the NXT North American title again. That's what I expected to happen. Pretty Deadly are going to defend the NXT Tag Team Championships against the Creed Brothers. I don't care for either of these teams. Not interested. Not at all. Flat. Look, I get Pretty Deadly. I get the I get the what they're trying to do with them and the flamboyant outfits they're wearing, which is fine. You know, I get it. And I can see where this that tag team will move up into the main roster. I could see that down the line. I really could. Uh, NXT Championship, Braun Breaker versus Joe Gacy. I'm already tired with this feud. And Joe Gacy without Harland? They've done a lot of changes to the character and they've gone certain directions, tried to go woke, and now he's more like a cult leader. I'm not much of the Joe Gacy either. I'm just not. I mean, I see what they're doing. And Braun Breaker is stuck in a bad storyline with this guy. I'm not into Joe Gacy at all. And listen, I watch NXT, but I'm not totally invested in it either, right? Now, I will admit there are things that I will watch on that show that will actually get my interest. Okay, every time I see Roxanne Cruz on my screen, because Roxy, I'm a big fan of hers, and I hope she does really well. And I think they're doing the right thing with that breakout tournament. And I hope she wins that damn thing because she deserves it. She should win that breakout tournament. Uh, I, like, I like Tiffany Stratton because she's good looking. She's a great looking woman. Otherwise, you know, I could see her being brought into the fold as a diva type onto that main roster. I could see that down the line. Nikita Lyons, when she gets herself back healthy again, sure. That Wendy Chu character, I'm not into at all. Not into at all. And they've changed that character up quite a bit. Just not likable at all. And to have her give a match against Mandy Rose for the women's title. Like, Toxic Attraction's great. You know, that's a that's a given 
you put that trio up in the main roster at some point. Not too far down the line either. Anyway, pretty deadly. Braun Breaker, Mandy Rose. We're not going to see any title changes on those, I don't think. I don't think Toxic Attraction is going to lose their belts to Caden Carter or the now named Katana Chance, former Casey Catanzaro. I don't think we're going to see anything like that happen. Toxic Attraction is going to win. Even if we had all the things that were going on in the background. Now, the other story there is, eh, okay. Look, the storyline with Tony D'Angelo, who's, I mean, he's just really doing a very stock version of Robert De Niro in Casino, a Joe Pesci in Casino, a Ray Liotta in Goodfellas. What other movies am I thinking of here? A Tony Soprano. He is that. And that's fine. Listen, if he wants to be the, you know, dime store version of Tony Soprano, that's fine. And, you know, it's not completely stinking up the joint. Like, it's a caricature. And his, you know, his family that he has with Troy Donovan and Channing Lorenzo, which I forget the names they call him. You know, whatever. And Legato del Fantasma, look. I don't know what to think about those guys either. I know everybody feels like there's a big thing about Legato the Fantasma, but like, I mean, yeah, it's like this whole cartel kind of thing. It's just another gang kind of a thing. But you know what? They're going to get lost. They're going to be about as important and about as as uh, impressive as Los Lotharios. Because once they leave the NXT fold, that gimmick's not going to stay. Or, or there's going to be something else different. Look, this is the Latina version, the Latin version of Hit Road. It is, because right now, whatever Legado the Fantasma had before, they feel like this is what Hit Row was, and I just don't see the real appeal that that a WWE is going to do with them. I mean, this storyline works right here, but. And I think that Tony D'Angelo is going to win. His team will win. And I think that Legato the Fantasma will have to join the Don of NXT. Period. I don't think it's going to be the other way around. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. And that's where I think things are going to go. I don't know. That's just where I'm at. WWE has their own issues where they're working with stars they're making sure that everybody stays on the level, they behave, and that this company's not what it was before. And Vince, under the hold of what the broadcast partners are having him do, and where things are running, I'll tell you, WWE is right now is a pretty tight run ship these days. They've been very efficient. They're doing NFTs, they're doing their work when it comes to promotion, the on air product. Is much more has a lot more continuity now than it has in a long time. It also they are trying to do things where they are trying to build up to next week. They're not always giving us those constant matches. Listen, the way they've been doing Raw this last couple of weeks, you get the countdown towards certain things that are going on in the night. The championship contenders match, they were promoting that. Cody speaking about Seth. The pull aparts they had this weekend on Raw, this week on Raw when it comes to Cody and all that with Seth. The conversation with Bianca Belair, Oscar and Becky Lynch, all of that. The Judgment Day stuff. All that's working, man. And they're giving three different things to watch throughout the night. They're constantly promoting. They're taking a little bit of a page of what AEW's been doing. Where they're just promoting the hell out of everything that's going on plastering what they have coming up on their shows all that going on it's quite amazing and so they've been doing that quite a bit and that's helpful because we're not hearing that much of the whole tearing up the script and rewriting the show in the last minute have we heard anything like that in a while no not in a while been a few months the issues when it came to like how the Royal Rumble was run the Wrestlemania was run all of that these last-minute decisions, like we can still get some of that, but there's a lot of things they're holding on to and doing what they're doing. They're following through. 
And that's important for them to do that. They need to be able to continue to do that going forward. All right. That's it for the show tonight. I don't say this enough, but if you've gotten to the end of the show, thank you for listening in and for listening to all these episodes that I do every week. I really appreciate it. Oh, by the way, Hell in a Cell predictions. We're going to do post shows. I will do one for Hell in a Cell this Sunday. And I will also talk about NXT in your house on that same show, Sunday night, post show, right here at WrestlingCosRoll.com. Make sure to rate and review the show where you get your podcast. So please give this show five stars on Spotify. Please put a review and a rating of five stars on Apple Podcasts. By all means, please do that. I want to really get more more attention to the show over there so that it will bump up because I don't get that many. I get a lot from iHeartRadio and from Spreaker and other places, but I want Apple and Spotify to really get some attention. So I really ask of you, if you haven't done so before, please rate and review my show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. If you've been a long time fan of the show, if you've appreciated what I've been doing with this program for almost 10 years now coming up in December, it's now nine and a half years almost to the day. I hope you will offer that for me because I don't ask for much of you, of this audience. I just appreciate you listening and hearing me rant every week as I do. Consistently, I don't miss a week. I hope you will consider doing that for me as a token of appreciation for all the all this time I've spent doing these shows, 695 of them to date so far. So I hope you'll do that for me. I'd really appreciate that. Please go ahead and rate and review Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And with that, enjoy NXT in your house and enjoy Hell in a Cell this weekend on pay-per-view or actually on Peacock. And we'll come back with another Wrestling Girls Podcast for all that because wrestling needs us. Thank you for listening to the Wrestling is Real Podcast. You can find all previous episodes at WrestlingIsReal.com or subscribe to the show on all major podcast outlets, including Apple, Amazon, Google, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Follow the King of Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at King of Podcasts. And search King of Podcasts on YouTube or type YouTube.com slash J-B-R-A-S-C-O-951. This has been a presentation of the King of Podcasts Radio Network. <laughs>